my mentor was Colin Boyd, and he was the man that taught me to doubt. And he taught me about earth energy, and he taught me about how he was interpreting a way of altering the, the uh, people's behaviour, actually, uh, by getting a group of people to communicate with the earth. And the, the response from the earth had a, an effect on all the people living around. And he did it, actually, when the mods and rockers came down to Brighton, and he started a thing called the Fountain, round about the fountain, that's why it's called the Fountain International. And he had a hundred people around just, just pouring uh, sort of good wishes and, and benevolence and calm into this area. And it had a profound effect on the way the, the mods and rockers. They, they were chucking stuff through shop windows before, and then they ended up exchanging helmets with policemen. And, and, and I mean, there was a huge difference, a measurable difference. The, the thing about the uh, Son of the Serpent was, I, I mean, it all started here. Uh, we were absolutely inspired by the St. Michael's Mount. It was three years worth of work to, to follow, um, well, 18 months of work to follow the Michael line, and then the realisation in the middle of the whole thing in Avonbury that we, there was another line. There was, a, there was a balance, there was a female balance, and, and nature needs a female balance. We should have known. It's there, an almost circular stone here, and the energy point is just to the right of that on the platform, and it, it, where, this is where the Apollo and Athena and the Michael and Mary actually meet at that point. The Earth has made a, a mathematical manifestation at this point, which is quite extraordinary. It took three years to develop. And it's now uh, four absolutely perfect 12-pointed uh, stars. Now, it progressively changed all the way up each time the Michael and Mary crossed. And when we started to check, as it changed, every point on the Michael and Mary changed its manifestation at the same time, which implies some sort of communication, some sort of intelligence coming down this, this earth energy. The energy on the Michael line was weaving around like a river, and it's a natural thing for earth energy to do. It's the whole joy of, of the, the, uh, the story and the three-year search developed from this point here. John Michel had uh, dug up some information uh, by the Rishi brothers in France about another lineup which included St. Michael's Mount and St. Michael's Kelleg in Ireland and came right up from, from Greece, right through Europe. The line through Europe was two and a half thousand miles long. England one was, was 300 miles long. And we thought there must be much more to learn, which in fact there was, and it took us 10 years to to uh, do this, this incredible journey down following the two lines actually that come across the bay here and cross at that point there. The manifestations again on the crossing points changed from uh, the, the original simple one on the St. Michael Skelly. It finally ended up with a sort of almost like a Rosicrucian sign, most extraordinary. The Apollo line came into the Apollo Temple of Apollo in Delphi, and it made a great loop round the stone, the Sibyl stone, where the oracle used to be. So obviously there was a distortion of the energy, and that would affect people. The scientists are recognising the importance of human consciousness and how it affects everything. I, I think that, that people underestimate the, the influence that we have, our consciousness have, on, on the Earth. Our oh, blacksmithing main, means a it means a great deal to me because well first of all it's about earning a living but the other thing is that with the other work that I do it's it's working with fire air earth and water and I think you have to be really brought down in close contact with the earth when you when you're working with the this sort of stuff you're working with earth energies and working with all that that sort of thing. But these these journeys around the world were, were uh, I mean, it was over the years, actually, and they, they, were, they were incredibly draining. I was under a huge stress to get the dowsing right, because we were always up against time and money. So these two things made us have to rush from one place to the other. And of course, we didn't know where we were going until we found out by dowsing. So we had no positive plan about where we were going to be or where we were going to go. And time after time, we would, we would, we'd have disciplined uh, two weeks or three weeks or something like that. And we come back having travelled almost thousands of miles, absolutely exhausted. And people would come along and say, oh yeah, have you been another holiday then? <laughs> and I used to say, oh my God, you know, what a holiday. <laughs> so it was so important to have this at the end of the journey, you know, the, the, the pure business of blacksmithing, this grounding uh, of, of fire, earth and water.
I developed a whole group of, of, of uh, customers, if you like, or potential customers or friends, who started giving really, really um, uh, very interesting commissions for sculptures. There was one particular sculpture in Penzance, which was great actually. It was a celebration of, of, of completing a garden. And it's called uh, Coming Home. Tony and I, I think we saw Cornwall coming back as returning to our Avalon. And what Hamish has done for us here is to gov give us something which gives me an extraordinary sense of joy. It's fun, it's moving, but it's so meaningful. I just wanted to include the wee gate. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. It earned our last visit to New Zealand where we finally met the Waitaha who started the whole thing about Palo community. The reason we went to, to uh, New Zealand to work with the energies there was, was quite simple because the Son of the Servant took us three years to do it across Aitland. It took ten years for the manifestations to change in the Dance of the Dragon. And I thought, well, surely I can find somewhere in the world for these manifestations to change faster. But it was only when we got to New Zealand, we suddenly realised that, that in, in the first visit, that these manifestations were, 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 were very complex and very profound, and there was an understanding of them from the Maori based on the, on the, the knowledge of the ancient people, the ancient Waitaha, and their culture of 2,000 years ago. And we learned so much from that so quickly. The earth is, is, is really, um, she, she is so benign and she's so kind to us, but I think that she's try, she really is trying to communicate with us by doing these manifestations, because there's no other reason to do it. This is a form of communication, and the basic form of, of uh, communication must be mathematical between two such diverse species. It's the only way they can communicate. While I was there, of course, I, I, I had some really very, very profound experiences indeed, uh, which, which actually probably uh, had the same effect as a near-death experience. And in fact, it was a very close to a near-death, another near-death experience, but it, it had a different form because there the, were the, the white ancestors in the background of this thing. And I hadn't realized just the immense power that their minds have. What however were a race that that uh, came from various different parts of the world actually. They had uh, uh, they had schools of learning which which uh, we don't begin to understand because they've taught them a degree of concentration that we can't conceive of now because we can't achieve that sort of, of, of level of concentration. The thing is that these, these people lived for a thousand years in total harmony with each other and with the earth. And they wasted absolutely nothing and they had a, a, a huge regard for, for every living form of, of uh, life on the island and for each other because they were, they were a completely mixed race different ethnic groups and they were in total harmony and they had no perception after a thousand years of war and they were capable of making decisions the leaders who made the decisions which were compassionate and fair for everybody i feel incredibly privileged to have been involved with the white heart the ancestors of the white heart the people the descendants of the white heart because of their way of living it was honest it was pure it was it was absolutely uh, in tune and in harmony with everything in nature and the cosmos. And I think we've got a great deal to learn from them. I've been really uh, very lucky because I've been able to go all around the world looking at sacred sites. But of course, every time I come back to Cornwall, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and, and, and so happy to be back here because it's, it has a magic all of its own and it has its, sacred, its own sacred sites. But one of the, one of the most powerful and the one, the one that affected me profoundly was the one in Castle Hill in, in South Island in New Zealand. It's a huge site and, and right in the middle of it there is a marae which is, is uh, related to the sacred Punamu stone where they used to collect the Punamu and, and uh, the women looked after this particular marae and it, that usually had a, a, a water filled basin in it. By the time we got there it had a dry season, it's all dried up and it was a sort of sandy base, a dusty base with, with rocks on it. And I started for, uh, dozing for the power centre and it had an extra five big energy lines which come in from different directions. I mean, there were 
they were bands of that sort of relative size and they were meeting here at that point. Now normally when you have something like that you have some sort of manifestation at the point which is an addition to the spiral and all the radials. And I went very confidently towards this thing because I thought here we have one of the major sacred sites in New Zealand. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I tried and I tried with, with every level of dowsing that I've got to try and find this thing because I felt that I was being the one who was inadequate and I wasn't being able to pick up the subtleties of what was happening in this site. And I was really seriously disappointed because I, I had a feeling that this place would be of some absolutely paramount importance in the work I've been doing. So in, in absolute despair, I just marked the place with a little stone. I felt totally inadequate, but I, I, I marked it because I, I still had the feeling that there was going to be, that there was something that was going to happen here. It's an important place. Amazing feeling of the whole massive great stones around and, and the magic of, of uh, ancient people and, and just a feeling, big feeling and then I had to walk away. I went back to this site the next day because I, I knew there was, and I was actually with a group of people and the group included a, an amazing Maori girl who'd said very, very little at all, but she'd been with this party and they were visiting sacred sites um, all around New Zealand and this, they happened to be visiting on this particular day. And I was sitting down at the, the, the edge of the, the site there and she was sitting a bit further along, didn't say anything at all. And she suddenly got up and she had a backpack and out of her backpack she took this enormous great uh, Punamu stone. This is, this is Punamu, the green stone, the, the peace stone. It's a magical, it's a, it's a jade type thing. It was much, much bigger than that, the one she had. And she, she suddenly started to walk in. Of course, the, I, I, I there was no marking on, on where, and my stone was one of a thousand stones in the middle of this place. I suddenly was aware of it, uh, getting this Punamu stone out, and walking very carefully into the center of this marae. And she, and she hadn't been there. Nobody had seen me dowsing. And she kicked the stone away with great ceremony, laid the stone down on that point, and then stood back and she raised her head and there was almost a complete metamorphosis. She was, she was sort of unshouldered and, and suddenly became almost balletic and started singing to the earth. And then she looked up and, and she beckoned because Barnt and two or three other girls were there and they all sang again to the, to the, to the earth. And it was a it was a, very, a delightfully peaceful ceremony, and I had to go off uh, looking for a well somewhere else. And Bar told me about the the detail of the end of the ceremony later in the evening. And I said I must go back and see, you know, if anything has, has, has happened to this place after this Maori girl had done the ceremony. So the following morning. Uh, I went up and where I had had no indication of a manifestation whatsoever the day before, or two days before, there was suddenly the most beautiful thing in the middle of it, which had formed itself, right on that point. This thing did not exist the day before. This thing was a direct result of Donna, Maori, close to the earth, singing consciously, communicating with the power center in the earth. And it's this, this sort of manifestation that, that, that it's just so important that, that people realize that they, they do have a, a direct communication through the consciousness with the, the, with the planet. And they can affect profoundly the, the, the future of the planet and the communication with the planet and the care for the planet by their, their thought and their, their concern for its being. I didn't realize at the time that in this, in this place where Donna had her experience, I would have a cathartic experience later on. We had uh, several visits to New Zealand, but this, this last one, we had done an awful lot of preparation for uh, setting up talks and visits and research into various sacred sites. Something happened in Singapore, either I drank the water or something bit me because uh, we were supposed to three, stay three days with uh, some friends of mine in Sydney. 
And when I got off the plane, I felt really, really ropey. And I finally got to the stage there where, where um, I was whistled into intensive care in the hospital. And for five days, I was on a drip feed, not, not anything to eat. Couldn't put my foot to the floor, got convulsive hiccups. And um, it got to the stage with Bar where, where we had a, an earnest discussion about how the hell to get me home. And we came to the conclusion <laughs> A quick cremation was probably the right job, and uh, Barker took me home in a in a uh, hand luggage on the rack. The thing is, in hospital, I had this amazing hallucination, I suppose, which lasted four consecutive nights. And the hospital changed into a laboratory with with uh, great big glass rectangular tanks with coloured fluid in them. And there were benign people feeding nutrients into the glass tanks, which had sort of amoeba-like shapes, and I was one of them. I was aware at the back of my bed of two immense creatures chuntering to each other, very, very deep voices, and say, it's all very well having to look after this creature, but it's made of very poor material. And I, I, got, I, I never actually saw them, but they were so familiar to me after five nights that I made a little sketch of them in the hospital of these creatures as I thought they would have to be. And although I was quite seriously ill, I wasn't really too worried about it because I, I knew I was being looked after by these huge, immense, benign creatures behind my bed in the hospital. And although all the plans that I had were completely scuppered, I had no idea what a wonderful experience I was about to have in Castle Hill. the Waitahawa and ancient people with a very, very special way of relating to each other in the air. And their culture came down through the women who remembered everything in meticulous detail through songs. The culture of the Waitaha was, was perfect memory, perfect uh, recollection, all that sort of thing. And they had this degree of concentration that we don't begin to understand. So the concentration by the women on their, their songs and the detail of the song means that the, the the detail of their culture came down through the songs with incredible accuracy. And they are such a shining example of what we could be. Going up to, to Castle Hill on the, at dawn on the last day, we knew that something important was going to happen. And we walked down with some difficulty, if you like, because my leg was still suffering from whatever had happened. And I asked the management if it was okay to sit down. And it was, you have to have these courtesies with the management and you can't take, ever take them for granted. So I asked if it was okay if I sat down. They said, no, it's fine. So I sat in the middle of this thing and I, I, I just relaxed into the whole energy of the place and got deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And there was nobody else there, Bar was there just observing, absolutely quiet, beautiful morning, a really uh, numinous feeling about the place. And suddenly I became aware that I was being watched. And I resisted it because I, was, I, I didn't want anything to disturb this thing. And eventually I just couldn't, couldn't stop myself turning around and I looked around and absolutely deep shock because I saw these two immense beings who had been behind my bed in the hospital and through them the, the ancient ancestors of the Waitaha came through with their concern and the, they came through as they had the Waitaha had the, had the men of the stone and they, they were men of the stone. And a lot of the communication was mind to mind and uh, they, they, they had a way of of conveying an idea that, that, that it's, it's beyond telepathy. It's, it's, it's some, some way of mind-to-mind -mind communication that goes beyond language. But it was couched in terms that I have to, I have to 
almost marginalised to try and get the whole essence of the, the message through. But their message was very, very loud and clear that they were deeply concerned about the state of the earth at the moment, particularly about the way we're choosing our leaders. Because their leaders were born in the right place, at the right time, under the right stars, with generations of, of uh, deep knowledge about the relationship with people. And they, they could make the decisions fairly for everybody. And they said this, the, the decisions that are being made are, are, are destroying our whole concept of, of, of living in harmony on the earth. And they were worried about their, their, uh, the way the medical people treat mind, treat bodies rather than mind, body and spirit together because their perception is they're inseparable. They have to treat them all uh, together. And of course they, they, they use natural medicines and, 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 but there was no, never any sort of, of commercial application to, to doing it. You're a healer and you treat it with natural medicines. And they were disturbed about, about the, the, the companies who, who, uh, who make money out of this sort of thing. Um, they were concerned about so many things, that, that, uh, but particularly the waste, the waste of food, the waste of, of, of the earth's resources, um, just to, to produce things that nobody really needs. And they reckoned that, that if, the, if, if things go on as they are, they were deeply concerned about what was going to happen to their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. And their message, it wasn't a complaining one, it was a, it was a, it was a desperation to try and understand what had happened to humans to create the world that we've created now. And when we came back, we had to. We decided we had to 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 do something about it. Try and get this message out to, to people, and, and try and lift the perception of, of of the people all around the world to the situation we're in. And this is what developed into Parallel Community. I found that uh, when I got back, I had been very very deeply disturbed at what had happened with my meeting, if you like, with the ancestors at Castle Hill. And it started a whole range of discussions about what, what on earth we could do about it. We were talking about it with, with lots of friends and we had this meeting at, at, uh, down at the Seed and a number of people, uh, different people come up every, every six weeks and we, we tune in with the earth and we, we celebrate the cycles of the earth. And this particular evening, it was pouring with rain, only five people turned up. So there were five of us at the meeting and there are frequently 20 or more. So we sat um, in a small group and uh, listened to some beautiful music. Gary Merrill was, was sitting in the back there and he suddenly looked up and he said, everybody, every human being has the right to live in peace, but we'll never get that peace until we claim the right. Hamish said he felt chills run down his spine. And I got immediately enthusiastic that, that uh, this is the message we're going to get out. We all have the right to live in peace and why shouldn't we? And who is making the decisions that make it impossible for us to live in peace? Everything is depending upon larger and larger organisations, whether it's governments, NGOs, corporations. Um, and it's almost as though the emphasis on big setups to accomplish anything almost disempowers people. Because people feel they can't do anything themselves because the solutions are all too vast. And these people are making a decision which is based not on caring for the people around them, but for the success of their particular company. We've been, not all over the world, we've been around quite a decent part of the world. We've talked to people about this. And every one of them says, yes, we agree with you. There is a huge problem. We have to solve it, but what can I do? So how do we do anything about that? Uh, we all get together. So from there, uh, it grew and um, more and more people wanted to know about it. And we had a meeting at Queen's Hotel Penzance. I'd say the Parallel Community is a platform for people who are no longer happy with being ignored and that they realise that the Parallel Community is a viable modern communications platform for people who are being ignored and who want their voices heard on a number of crucially important issues where decisions are being made for them that they don't they don't care for and they never voted for. The idea of the parallel community 
was in a sense looking at what people can get together to do. People who um, feel isolated, who feel that they're not get, getting anywhere, that they are fighting a battle on their own, not realizing that there are millions of us all in the world and we just need to connect. The par parallel community is an empowerment or a voice for empowerment that says, look, you know, if people are voting for a massive expenditure on nuclear deterrence and things like that that uh, people may not be entirely comfortable with, then um, what do you do? Where do you go? Uh, marching, marching down Whitehall we know no longer works. So somewhere where people actually have a platform to express their opinion in a cogent, sane, intelligent fashion. If enough people can actually do that, then, then perhaps there will be some recognition that there is a voice that needs listening to. And to show people that they're not alone, that one person working in their village or their town or their community may be doing exactly the same as another group in another village or town or community, but not knowing it. Try and get all of these people together by means of a website so they have a contact, they know, what, they know what's happening in their, their local patch, they know what's happening in the next patch. And we want to encourage some sort of community way of thinking, which says, OK, how does this... this uh, we can't sort the global problem out at the moment. How do we sort our local problem out? And if we have a local problem, is it the same as the community next door? If we have a solution to our particular problem, can we help that community? And it starts in a very small way with individual people. We see the parallel community as a network and connectors are people within that network that can connect to their local area. I don't believe we can look to any institutions to do it for us. I think we have to do it ourselves. And I also don't believe anyone has the mandate to tell anyone else what those changes ought to be, which is really quite strange. So the idea of uniting people and linking people and getting people together um, who are already trying to change their communities in whatever way it may be. We're not going to dictate, because we just do not want to be any dogma or anything like that, but people can come in with their ideas, and even if we don't kind of have that on our agenda, we will know where we can put that person with that idea, connect them up to somebody else, so that we form like a, a connector, if you like. We don't want to be aggressive, we don't want to confront the existing situation. It's a complete waste of time. Let's, let's just set up something alongside it and say we accept what you're doing uh, and we accept that it is difficult to change the status quo but we're not going along with you we're going over this way and we're going to bridge over what you're doing i'm not for a second criticizing anybody who actually feels they're prospering under the present system and that, that, and that everything is okay all right that's fine the reason the parallel community thing actually became, or the reason for that terminology was that acknowledging that direction for a large number of people, but there's also an, a lot of people, another large number of people who, if you like, would maybe be quite happy to run alongside that, not saying, you know, okay, I can't play with your colour ball because it's not working for me, so we're going to play with another colour ball and see if that works for us alongside each other, perfectly friendly. We respect your right to do that. It's not something we wish to get into bed with or something we feel is, is letting us down as a community. So side by side makes, makes an awful lot of sense. The parallel community's emblem is almost like a bridge going over a river that we are going to just bridge over and the rest can do what they like, but um, we will walk over the bridge and try and live and um, give an example that there is another way. I feel that politicians are doing what they can do. I, um, I don't think we want to be involved with, with politicians as such. I think somehow we need to find new structures, new ways of going on, which perhaps are outside politics, they're outside religion, they're outside the institutions that we now have so that we can find different ways of doing it to change the energy of the present systems that we're all thinking are outmoded now. It is literally impossible, I think, to be elected to that august body, Houses of Parliament, and try and change anything. It won't happen. If anyone wishes to engage in politics, however idealistic they might be to begin with, to get to the point within the political apparatus where they can actually accomplish anything, effectively they have to conform to the status quo. Um, and so the more people 
actually achieve positions of power, the less free they are to change anything in any fundamental way. And to that extent, I think we need to look outside politics. Um, not to go against it. Politics works only so far as people believe in it. Um, if anything, the parallel community needs to show that there are other things to believe in. What we're trying to do in, in, in parallel community is to bridge over traditional boundaries in, in every sense, in social sense, religious sense, uh, national sense, every sense, and get back to the importance of people. And also to provide, through the web, a place, a centre, if you like, where people can uh, join in or, or refer to or something. So that they have in, in the, the, the bush in Australia, if they like, they can contact this, this, the parallel community with a problem and get some sort of answer. What we basically want to do is to, to build up a, a sound footing to, 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 uh, locally in the local community, get the expertise that we need for research and, and for uh, dealing with the, the questions and the emails from all sorts of disciplines, and have a place where people who say, what can I do about this whole situation, can come to us and say, what can I do to help? And we will start off by very, very simple things, like, like guiding them towards uh, their, their own community and how they can help in that. Already we have 40 connectors from all over the world, um, from Britain to Europe, Switzerland, Amsterdam, Germany, uh, to Australia, South Africa, America. It's quite remarkable, um, you know, word of mouth only really. One person tells another person tells another person and they are inspired to join in. I think it's helping the world, to, people to live together more um, accepting and um, appreciative of other people so that we just live in a more peaceful way. We want to become a centre of, of knowledge and, and uh, ways of, of moving our community spirit forward. The essence is to, to get people back to doing practical things. Practical things, not necessarily in the terms of, of making things, but practical uh, living with your neighbours. Not just your immediate neighbours, but your neighbours in the next country, if you like. And that takes us right through the whole religious bit and the whole political bit and, and, and things like that. Say, OK, your, religious, your religion is so-and-so, your colour is so-and-so, your country is so-and-so, but we're all people and we've forgotten how to communicate directly. How are you? Are you OK? That's all you need to do. It doesn't take any time at all. It doesn't cost you anything. But it starts building up a whole rapport with, with the community and that's what we're trying to do. Speak to people, smile more often, um, visit uh, neighbours or people in one's own village or town and just get to know people because a lot of people are extremely lonely as we've discovered. Simple things do make a difference. Once we join up and get maybe a few thousand, maybe a few hundred thousand, but we're looking actually for millions of people and we're not going to march with placards and, and things like that. We're going to quietly say to the politicians, wonderful, 10 million people would like this to happen. Listen to us. We have no desire to become a political party. Now, that's not to say that there will be political consequences if the thing re actually achieves a, a certain critical mass, because inevitably, if you, if you make enough, enough mass, then the politicians then have to turn around and say, well, actually, there appears to be a problem because we're not satisfying what the, uh, a, a large number of people appear to require. Or need. Instead of being told this and this is going to happen, it would give us a voice to discuss it and maybe we might learn that we are wrong on some things, um, but it's the ideas of not having a voice. I think we will become a significant voice that the government will have to take notice of. Now whether they regard it as um, a pain in their derriere is something they have to decide. I think that the more the more critical or the, the, the bigger the number, they will have to be at least aware. One thing I would love to see is people spoiling their ballots at a general election paper with a parallel community infinity logo, which really says, look, I'm not, I can't vote for any of this. How about this? Because every single ballot paper will have to be shown to every candidate on election night. Now that would be something. At least then they'd say, well, what's going on? Something interesting happening here. People are getting a little disillusioned with the political system. What, what is this symbol? Why are people doing this? They will know through our web 
that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people are thinking this particular way. And it must influence the, the um, decision-making process. And I've got a lot of respect for parliamentary traditions, etc. They represent us when they start to rule us. I think we have a problem. And I think we need to be aware of it. The Patriot Act in, in America, which suddenly appeared four days after the 9-11 thing, which patently had been written a long, long time before that, was pushed through the American uh, Senate, if you like, uh, with one abstention. And the one abstention apparently was the one man who, hadn't, who, who said he hadn't read it and he couldn't, he couldn't vote for it because he hadn't read it. Apparently there were only two copies of 394 pages of this act and it was pushed through and the Patriot Act means that I can be, if I criticise Mr Bush, which I'm not doing at the moment, if I criticise Mr Bush, I can be taken out from here and put into Guantanamo Bay or the equivalent sort of thing without any reason at all except that if I, uh, if I disagree with anything that, that the, the uh, Bush administration says, I am a terrorist or a potential terrorist. And that's what that act means. And these things are being, are being just pushed through at, at odd times. And we're having the same sort of performance happening in this country. And it's about, uh, it's about control. It's about the, the, the build-up of the terrorist thing. We've had terrorists around the world for, for generations. I'm really worried about this technique of building up fear of terrorists because one terrorist is another freedom fighter. It always has been that way. At the moment, we're a, we're a species driven by fear. We are afraid of um, war. We're afraid of not coping. We're afraid of authority. And that's increasingly the case with the, with the setup at the moment. Uh, we're afraid of not being able to pay the mortgage. We're afraid of not having enough money. We're afraid if we have enough money that we're going to lose it. Uh, and we live in a state of fear all the time. There are people who are, there are many, many, many people who are afraid to walk out of their houses in case they are attacked, in case they, this is not a way to live. There is no reason at all why we shouldn't live in joy. There needs to be some interference. There have to be laws. And, and yes, we, most of us are quite law-abiding, actually. But to create more and more and more and more restrictive laws that, that is, is, is just not the answer. These controls are becoming onerous. And we have to start re-establishing our, our rights and our freedom uh, and our ability to make decisions about our own lives but accept responsibility for them. We all say, yes, I'd like peace, I want to live in a peaceful world, but can we actually claim that for ourselves and be peaceful ourselves? And that's where it begins. The future for Parallel Community will lie in connecting people who are able to take various groups, individuals, small groups, bigger groups of people under the web umbrella and look at the objectives that are actually spelled out on that website. One of those is that all of us have the right actually to live in peace. What Hamish and I um, are interested in, um, which may seem a bit weird to other people, is the fact that it teaches you that nature around us is alive and we can make a difference um, by what we do and what we think and in making a difference to the world around us makes a difference to us. It's, a, it's a, a flowing from us to the earth and from the earth to us, so it's a knock-on effect. The earth responds to ritual and ceremony and attention. And that's why the ancient peoples built Stonehenge and different sacred places like that. So you can actually re-enchant old sacred places or create new ones yourself and the earth will respond to that on your estate, in your street, in your close and then in your town and out the energy goes and that really does have a profound effect. Every single thing we do, there's a reaction for every action. You become part of what you're around, you can't help that. And everything we do, everything, all of us do, is completely interconnected, negative or positive. So it might as well be positive. Doing nothing, I don't think it's really an option anymore. There is another way of living. And yes, it's, it's uh, actually, the, uh, 
I had this extraordinary out of the body experience, and I went up and I, I and I met the management. I call them the management, lovely people actually. And I realised in the short time I was up there, it might have been microseconds, I don't know, but there is a huge amount of humour in the universe, and the humour and the and the laughter and the joy is being crushed out of us because you can't control people who are laughing. It's time we we just just shook our heads and, and got out of this and, and said. Okay, what are we going to do about it? So join Parallel Community.